Yeah, man. Thank you, Juan. This morning, uh, remember the way that. I, good morning, everyone. By the way, uh, good, do you remember last week I said I was going to be uh, slightly shorter? I said it would be shorter last week. Well, apparently I, I was no liar. Let's just say, apparently it was thirty seconds shorter than usual. So, uh, so I was told. But anyway, I was shorter. So this morning uh, we come to Romans five, uh, and I want to begin with a, a quote from a movie, and there will be, I will bring someone a bar of chocolate next week if they can guess the, where, what, what movie this quote is from. I don't expect many to get it, uh, but if you get it, I'll be really impressed. I, I definitely will. Uh, the quote is this, there are two kinds of pain in the world, pain that hurts and pain that alters. There are two kinds of pain in the world. Pain that hurts and pain that alters. Pain that changes things. If you can get that, I'll, I'll speak to you after. The reality is, though, folks, that we all suffer. We all suffer. And we all go through times of suffering, times of pain, uh, and times of distress. And when you're in the middle of that suffering and when you're in the middle of that distress, all, all kinds of things can happen to you inside. But one of the things that can happen when you're in pain, when you're in distress, and when you're going through times of suffering and trial, one of the things that can happen to you is that you lose heart or lose hope. And what Paul is going to do in Romans chapter 5 is he's going to give the believer a, a reality check on that hope that we have. There is hope, folks, that is immune to our suffering and our trials. There is hope that perseveres through our suffering and through our trials, even though those, those trials and suffering are, are painful, there is a hope that sustains and a hope that is immune to those things. In verse 2, Paul is going to say, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And throughout Romans 1-4, to Paul has shown that God's promises are, are, are held by the empty hands of faith. We come to that point last week again that, that we obtain uh, the hope that we have through simple childlike faith and there's no other way to get it. Simple childlike faith. And in Romans 1 to 4, Paul has been building a picture. He's been telling us, uh, uh, giving us a, a picture of the state of humanity, the fallenness of humanity, and now you'll know from, from being in here, if you've been in here before many times, you, you, you probably saw the hinge there at the start of what Joe read for us. There is a hinge word. Therefore. Therefore. So everything that Paul has said to this point, he now hinges it by that one word, therefore. Everything that has went before, Therefore. You'll know the good hermeneutic principle uh, of Bible interpretation. Uh, therefore, what is the therefore? There's an assumption made here at the start of this passage this morning. And the assumption is that Paul is now talking to those who have been what? Justified. Paul is now speaking solely to those who have been justified. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And I need to say this this morning because it's important. Paul is speaking to the church. Paul is speaking to those who have been justified. What comes next only applies to those who have been justified. And if you're in here this morning and you've known what it is to be justified before God by faith and by faith alone, what comes next applies to you. If you're in here this morning 
and you do not know what it is to be justified before God, what comes next does not apply to you. You get the lesson on. You get to hear the benefits of what it is to be in the family of faith. You get to hear what it is, the benefits of, of what faith means, to what, to what it means to be justified. But the following verses don't apply to you. That's the reality. And yet you get to listen to what applies to those who have been justified. And so what are the benefits of justification? What are the benefits of being made right before God? Paul is going to answer this question. How do I know these things are true for me? How do I know that these benefits are true for me? How do I know what it, what it means to be justified? Will God stick with me? Will he not give up on me? And there's a real sense of, of, of Paul communicating the hope that is in the gospel for those who have been justified. Because the reality is, and I'm sure this is your reality as well, if you are one of those in here this morning who have been justified, I am sure there are times that you struggle with your assurance. I'm sure there are times you struggle with, uh, am I really saved? What does this mean for me? We all, want that, we all want that security, that assurance in our relationship with God, that this is real. And what Paul is going to press home and what he's going to do in this section is going to give them that assurance and that security. That's what's going on. And Paul is going to say that this hope that we have is grounded somewhere. It's not some ethereal hope out there that there's just pie in the sky stuff. It is grounded What's it grounded in? It is grounded in the fact that we have been justified. That's where it's grounded. And Paul is going to say that there are past, there are past realities, there are present realities, and there are future realities of our justification. Look at the tenses that are used. Verse 2, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, even in that verse there alone, you see that there's, te there's different tenses used. Past tense, present tense. We have obtained. We now stand. Past and present. There are future benefits as well, that we will rejoice in our sufferings. That's a future benefit of our justification. We have peace with God. Present. And so what we're going to do this morning is just basically look for our first sort of point is I want to look at these, these, these tenses that we see here and, and, and where, our, where our hope is, is grounded this morning. Where our hope this, hope, this solid hope that we have, where is it grounded? In verse 2, Paul says this, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So, we rejoice in the hope, not only that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character hope. You'll know these verses. I guarantee you, you'll know these verses. But look at verse 1 with me there for a second. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's a, that's, a, that's a reality of our justification. We have peace with God. Now, we need to be really careful how we read that verse. Because we can read that verse and think feelings. We can read that verse and think, oh, I, I, am, I, I have a peace inside me and I feel peaceful with God. That's not what the verse means. That's not what the verse means. It's not a I feel peace verse. This is a peace status. I have peace with God. This is a justification peace that God has reconciled himself with us. We are reconciled to him. Where there was war, there is now peace. Because that's the reality. 
before you were justified, before God reached down and pulled you out of the Mary clay and put your feet on the rock and, and saved you, you were at war with God. Now, I, I know that some of us don't maybe think of it like that or think, of, like, well, it wasn't really that bad. I wasn't actively going out. I'm not as if I'm going out and being like this or that against God. The Bible tells us that before Christ, we were at war with him. We are his enemy. Enemy. But now we have peace with him if we're justified. Folks, that is good news. Why is that good news for you this morning? Why is that good news for me this morning? Because we need to hear that. Because here's the reality of your spiritual life. And I have no doubt of this. The accuser will come to you. And the accuser will remind you of things in your past. And the accuser will come and say, ah, yeah, you think you're a Christian, you think you're this, you think you're that, but what about this that you did? What about this that you were? What about this that you said? What about this that you thought? Anybody know? Anybody know the reality of the accuser coming to you and saying those things? That is one of his greatest tactics, is to come to you and accuse you of your past. But Paul is saying here this, you have peace with God. Done. That is good news. That is one of the greatest benefits of justification, that there is now peace between you and your Almighty, and you can put your head on the pillow at night and sleep well in the knowledge that that is fact. Yes? Yes. Because I have no doubt that some of you are tortured by your past. Guilt, condemnation. But there are... There, We'll get to it, my favorite verse in Scripture, Romans 8, chapter 1, or verse 1, where it says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why? Because you have peace with God. Peace. So when you look back over your history, and depending on the day probably about how you're feeling, but how you interpret your history, and how you interpret your past must be done through a gospel lens. That it's gone. That it is gone. And you now have peace with God. Don't listen to the accuser. Remind him of the peace that you have with God. If you stand firm in it, that's where you are now. That's who you are now, that you have peace with God. Your past, no matter how messy, how broken, how ugly, whatever it might have been, is healed. It's gone. Christ has made you whiter than snow. That's who you are. You have peace with God. That's the past. We have that's a past benefit of justification. Now you, that's where you stand. It, is, it has been accomplished. Paul goes on to say, you have access into this grace in which we now, present tense, stand. It's not that just, you have this past thing that has happened, but, but now you stand. You're justified and you stand in that peace. And we stand in this immovable grace that Romans tells us about. Romans, Romans 6 will tell us that we, and sin has, has no dominion on you now, has no power over you now, has no control over you now. But you're, you're not under law, you're under grace. That's the present benefit. That is where you are. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? For the Christian, you have peace with God. You're not on thin ice anymore. I, I, I reckon that some of us are walking around like we're on the lake and there's a bit of ice and we, we, we take a wrong step, that's it, it's done. That's not the case. You're on firm ground. You stand in the peace which was bought for you on the cross. And Paul is not here. He said elsewhere, therefore, st stand, therefore, stand. Don't bow again. Don't, 
Don't let yourself be controlled by the fact that you, you think you're on thin ice. You're not. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He'll never fail you. He'll never forget you. He'll never cease to actively care for you. That's where you are. That's where you are. So past, we have a peace. Present, we stand. Future, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What does that mean? That this hope, this hope word that keeps coming up in Scripture. This is not a hope that is flaky or a hope that is, as I say, ethereal out there. This is a solid, firm, foundational hope. A sure and certain hope, as Hebrews talks about. This is solid hope. We're sure of it. It's not, I hope somehow, by on somehow, that United will be able to win this afternoon. That is not the hope that we're talking about here. That may or may not happen, probably not. But it's not what we're talking about here. The Bible says this is a sure and certain hope. A sure and certain hope. There is a certainty to what God will do. Hebrew talks about it being an anchor for the soul. Provides security. Provides us with a solid foundation when all of our circumstances are changing around us. When they're changing and shifting. Tim Keller says this, this is how hope is defined in the Bible. He says this, it's life-shaping certainty of what you're going to have, but you don't have it yet. That's what this hope is that we're talking about. Life-shaping certainty of what you're going to have, but you don't have it yet. There is a day coming when you will have all the things that have been promised to you and everything will be made new. And everything will be made right. Now, I need to repeat this. What I've just said about a peace with God, past, having peace with God, standing in that peace, and the hope that we have is for those who have been justified. None of that is a reality for those who are not justified. None of it. If you're in here this morning and, and you, you don't know if you're justified before God and you don't know if you're right before God and you don't know if, if, where, where you stand before God, none of that is a reality for you. You have no peace with God. None. Your present reality is so shaky. You are tossed with the wind to and fro. There is no security for you. You are on thin ice. And there is no future hope. None. Zero. In, in Cornerstone lately, and just in life lately, we've, we've been confronted a lot, I think, with the reality of, of life and the reality of death and the reality of illness and the reality of, of suffering. I think, I think it's, it's come very close to us lately. And these are serious issues. And the gospel is a serious thing. And people are facing eternity every single day without the hope that those who have been justified know. And folks, that is a scary thing. That is a scary thing, a sobering thing. But for those of us in here this morning who have been justified, what peace. 
what peace to know that you are okay before God. That you can't put your head on a pillow and you can rest knowing that you're secure. Knowing that your eternal destiny is set. What peace. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We have peace, we stand in that peace, and we hope for a future with Christ. But there is a, there's a mystery that comes along with this hope that we have. There's a mystery. So, if you're taking notes the, the first thing really is the source of our hope is grounded in realities that we've just said, uh, future, present, or past, future, present realities. The source of our hope. The second thing that we see is this mystery of hope that we see here. Paul says in verse 3 and 4, words that are strange. Words that are difficult to comprehend. He says this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Though those are strange words. Rejoice in our suffering. That's an amazing statement to me. A, a shocking, surprising statement. I, I wonder how that lands. I always think this morning when when, when I'm up here. Uh, week by week, and I say things like that, that there, I wonder how that lands with you. I wonder how that sits with you, and perhaps you're, you're suffering at the minute, perhaps you're struggling at the minute, perhaps you're going through a time of, of, of real trial. I wonder when I say rejoice, Paul says, the Bible says, we're to, we rejoice in our sufferings. How does that land? Because it's strange. It's mysterious. So what, what is Paul saying here? And I want to follow Paul's logic here. He starts at the end of verse 2, and he says, we will rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then he launches into this, rejoice in suffering. And you'll see it here. It's almost, there's, there's, two, there's, a, there's, a, there's a section here that's bookended. He says, through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And, the, and this hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. What is Paul saying? It's a mystery. You'd think that Paul would say you suffer And you get through it. But that's not what he says. He says you have hope. You suffer. And you have more hope. Suffer. A hope. Suffer. More hope. How on earth does that work? One pastor said this. Suffering, we could define suffering as this. It's favorable circumstances going away. Favorable circumstances going away. Or what the world might call happiness. Going away. And you see, that's the difference, folks, and this is really important. Christian hope is not happiness. Happiness. Christian hope is not the same as what the world would call happiness. Happiness is based on circumstances. Hope is based on Christ. So how can we rejoice in these when our, when our favorable circumstances disappear? How, how can we rejoice? How can we suffer well? How can we hope in that suffering and end up with more hope? Well, 
Well, what suffering does for the believer, what suffering should do for the believer, is drive them further into God. That's what's different. That's the thing. That's the key. For the believer, for those who have been justified, Paul is talking to those who have just been justified, the key to suffering well, the key to suffering, rejoicing in our suffering, is this. We move towards the unshakable object. The unshakable object being Christ. For those who do not have this hope, for those who are, aren't justified, when, when favorable circumstances are taking, taken away, what happens? Their world crumbles. Because they have nowhere to go. Nothing to cling to. No hope. Burke Parsons said this, we run to God in the midst of a trial only to learn that it was He who was the one that sent the trial that we might run to Him. I, I know I sound like a broken record when I say these things, but do we see that? That we are in the hands of a sovereign God. And what does a sovereign God want His children to do? A sovereign God wants His children to run to Him. And what does a sovereign God know that will make us run to Him? Suffering. Trial. We, we know this to be true. We know that in the realities of life, when things are going well, when things are chipper, when things are great, we do not run to God. We know that. We're human beings. We know that to be reality. When suffering comes, when trial comes, when hard things happen, where does the believer run? Into the arms of a loving Father who he knows cares for them. That's what happens. Or that's at least what should happen. And so suffering, trial comes, we we rejoice in, in, in the trial and we run to God, our Father. Suffering yields rejoicing. Now, I would say there's not one of us in here who have been justified, who are believers, who are following Christ, who would not say, well, do you know what? I see these verses here. I love, I love these verses. These are like coffee, coffee cup verses. I like these verses. Because not only that do we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And if I was to go to you this morning and say, who wants endurance? You'd be like, oh, yes, I want endurance. And I, who, who, who wants these things? Who, who wants endurance? Yes, me. Who wants character? Me. Who wants hope? Me. Well, do you see how they're produced? Suffering. Trial. Who wants them? This is the reality. This is not some sort of Christianity that is yay happy all the day. This is life. Now, I would love to do a survey. Do you see the difference between this and, a, and, a, and a, this gospel, which says this is going to be life, and life's going to be really hard, and in the hard things, run to God. And in, when you run to God in the hard things, He will produce a, a rejoicing in you that is supernatural, that is a mystery. And you will come out of that suffering with endurance and with, with hope and with perseverance and with more hope. That's what will happen to you. Do you see the difference between that and a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel? They're night and day. They're night and day, folks. Because we know the reality of life. We know that every single person in this room will bump up against suffering and trial at some stage. Just a reality.
You could get a phone call tomorrow from a parent with a diagnosis that is not favorable. Your family might fall apart. Your child may go through something traumatic. Suffering. Paul is going to say to us who have been justified, it is these very things that will produce in you these things that have been listed. Suffering, folks, is never just for suffering's sake. It's always doing something in us. Always. When Paul says we rejoice in our sufferings, What he doesn't mean we just grit our teeth and bear it. We don't rejoice in suffering for suffering's sake. Nor, might I add, is is Paul recommending that we go looking for it. Because trust me, you will not need to. We don't just grit our teeth and bear it. We rejoice in it because we know that if we look at it correctly, it is producing something in us. Perseverance. This word here means focus. Literally means focus. Perseverance, focus. What it means is that we focus on what's important. You know the reality of that. You know the reality of when things go south, when trial comes, when trouble happens, it 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 narrows our focus. All of a sudden we 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 block out the things that don't really matter. It focuses our attention on what does matter. When a death happens, when someone gets cancer. When these things happen, what do, you, what do you hear people say all the time? What really matters? Perseverance, focus. Suffering is the only thing that will do that. Character. Character means testedness. Perseverance leads to character, testedness, knowing that you can come through something because you've already been through it. If I, if I went on to my, uh, I, I see this all the time on my Strava feed. Uh, when you go on to Strava, right, and you see somebody's been out cycling in, in wet weather or bad weather or whatever it might be, out, out for a run in bad weather, you'll see the free character building. That, it always appears. I saw someone last week put it on character building, right? And there's a sense in which that's a reality. They've, they've got it right. Because when you go out in bad weather, when you go out in, in weather that's not favorable, when you go out and you get it done, what does it, what does it tell you? It tells you you can go through it again. You've done it. Testedness. You know you can go through it. And that's what suffering produces. You know you'll not be overwhelmed. You'll know you'll not go under. You'll know you'll get through it. Why? Because you've done it before. And He has brought you through. And He has been faithful. And He has got you through before. Testedness. And then hope. Sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. But look at how they're produced. Suffering. That's a mystery. That is the mystery of this hope that we have. 
that when we're in the midst of suffering, we know that suffering is doing something and suffering is producing something in us and no suffering is for suffering's sake alone. So take hope in that this morning, folks. That these things are a reality, again, for those who have been justified. I must remind you, we are talking this morning to those who have been justified. If you have not been justified, scratch that for you. Suffering is just terrible for you. Because you don't see it doing anything. So, we have the source of hope, the mystery of hope, and then we have the guarantee here at the end. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Bear in mind, this is Paul's first mention of the work of the Holy Spirit in Romans thus far. I don't know if you've picked that up. The, the, the person, this is the first mention of the person of the Holy Spirit and what he does. Uh, and if you look at these verses and if you look at the flow of these verses, uh, Verse 5 is a bit of a problem. Because verse 5 is actually very hard to reconcile to verses 1 to 4. Hope does not put us to shame. You, you would think that Paul might say, hope does not put us to shame because everything's going to work out all right in the end. Or hope does not put us to shame because you know you're going to get through it and it'll all be great. No, he says, hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has poured, God, poured God's love into your heart. You took a bit of a direction there, Paul. We thought you were going to go a different way. But now you're saying, oh, okay, hope doesn't put us to shame. Why does hope not put us to shame? Because God has poured His love into our hearts through the person of the Holy Spirit. As I say, this is the first mention of the Holy Spirit in Romans. And the Holy Spirit, folks, we need to know, understand the role of the Holy Spirit, I would imagine. Probably I need to understand the role of the Holy Spirit a little bit better. And, and this gives us the role, part of the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, and this is one of the ways in which you'll know if you're justified. You're sitting in here and you're wondering this morning if you're justified. You're wondering if you're right with God. This is one of the tests. What has the Holy Spirit done in your life? Because the Holy Spirit, it's like, it's like he, gives us, he gives us these lenses to see our lives through. He gives us gospel lenses, as it were, to see our lives through. The Holy Spirit, folks, is not pouring some warm fuzzies into your life. That's not what he's doing. It's not what he's about. The Holy Spirit has poured what into our lives? The love of God. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Third person of the Trinity comes to inhabit the Christian. And one of the things that he does when he inhabits the Christian is to, to point us to the promises of God. And one of the promises of God is this, that, that, that he loves us. He loves us. John Scott said this in his commentary on Romans. He said, What the Holy Spirit does is make us deeply and refreshingly aware that God loves us. Is that your reality? Has that been your reality? Do you know the Holy Spirit pouring the love of God into your heart and, and assuring you of your salvation. Do you know He loves you? And that's, folks, where we're going to finish today. Do you know, Christian, 
who has been justified, that God loves you. Do you know that He loves you? That He's not putting up with you, but in fact He loves you. With everything He has. He loves you. He loves you. It's very simple, but it's very true. Hope does not put us to shame. But to give us the hope that we have, Christ was put to shame for us. Hope does not put us to shame. But to give us the hope that we have, Christ was put to shame for us. I want to finish this morning by reading the words of Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Because here we see Christ being put to shame so that through the hope that we have, we would not. Let me read. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Therefore, those who have been justified, God loves you. Let me pray. Father, we plead now that you would do the work that you've said you would do through the power of the Spirit and pour your love into our hearts. And help us to know how much you actually love us. In Jesus' name, amen.